we're trying to do in, in the Bible study here tonight. We want all of you to be in the word. We want you to study to show yourselves approved. Workmen that need not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So there's such a need for us to study ourselves. As we study and as we come to a place where other people are studying, he can get so much more growth in our families, in our churches, in the place where he has placed us. So we're here in Acts 6, and there's a lot to say in this chapter. Let's go ahead now. We'll share my, my outline. Great growth and growing trouble in the church. That's what I want to talk about. Because with the growth of the disciples, there's trouble. Trouble comes along with it. It always comes hand in hand. When God works, there's trouble as well at the same time. And it'll be this way till the end of the world. But what's the emphasis I want to talk about is solving a serious assault on biblical unity. There's many assaults against the church. But what's the serious one that could really take it down? That's the one you got to focus on and pivot on and pay attention to. There's levels of attacks against the body of Christ. But the toughest ones are the internal ones. That's the hardest ones from within. They are the most dangerous. And Acts 6, 1 says, Now at this time, while the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint arose on the part of the Hellenistic Jews. This is more urgent and more alarming than being thrown in prison and being in front of the Sanhedrin and being questioned and maybe even being beaten. This is a much more serious type of thing. So we're going to talk about this thing tonight is the assault. And I wanted to uh, just call this idea, what is biblical unity? How do you know what to defend if you don't even know what it is? What should we defend? Some people defend the wrong things. Look in Ephesians 4. Ephesians 4 verse, verse 1. Therefore, I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing tolerance for one another in love, being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. We are called to preserve the unity of the Spirit. So that there's all sorts of unities in the world. There's ethnic unity. There's theological unity. There's neighborhood unity. There's college mascot unity. There's, uh, you know, I don't know, maybe your name. Sometimes there's a name. There, there's worldwide conventions about a name. I heard the name Ryan was a convention. People came to Southern California for the name Ryan. There's all these reasons for unity. But what is God's place of unity for the church? It is called the unity of the Spirit. The unity of the Spirit. That is, the Spirit of God is working for specific ends and goals in our age. The Spirit of God is working to build the church. Where the Lord Jesus Christ is the center, the preeminence. And He only has one mind. The Spirit is not confused. The Spirit does not fight with Himself. He knows exactly what He's doing. So, in every Christian church, we are to preserve what the Holy Spirit wants to do in that gathering. Church by church by church by church. What is the Holy Spirit doing? That's what we need to guard. That word preserve mean, means to guard. And it says you guard it in the bond of peace. You don't guard it by yelling at people. Or talking them down. Or having public meetings where you confront. Now in pub, private, and maybe one or two people, you might have an opportunity for that. But not in the church. Venting is a terrible way to have a Christian fellowship. You don't do that in, in the church. It's in the bond of peace. Let's look at an illustration. We want to identify a dangerous fault today. That's the San Andreas Fault. That's a fault, okay? Now you see it on the right side the map of California. The left is the fault. That's a snapshot of a part of the fault. You see it kind of running up, up and down the state. So we have to ask, 
what faults are in your church? Are there earthquake faults in your church? Are there earthquake faults in your family? You know, the fault is dangerous when there's pressure on it. The pressure will bring the shaking. And sometimes, you know, when, when, when everybody has a job and everyone in the church has lots of money and everyone's young and everyone's whatever, you know, it's nice, kind of easy to all get, get along, kind of, you know, kind of. But when you have pressure and problems, what's going to happen to that church? So do we identify dangerous faults in the church? Do we do that? Now, the wrong thing is to ignore others. And when, when things are happening, do we ignore? Do we blame? Or maybe we cause the faults. Maybe we're the one causing the faults. Or maybe you make them worse. But how do you deal with faults in a Christian family? Or a Christian church? Or a Christian ministry? You empathetically connect. You, you connect with empathy. It doesn't mean you endorse wrong reasoning. It doesn't mean you agree with someone's uh, wrong way of saying But you're empathetic. That's all. You, you intercede for others, especially in prayer. You're an intercessor. You're not an accuser. Revelation 12, Satan is the accuser of the brethren. May we not take that role ever. Do we avoid exaggerating or calling things to people's attention that we don't need to talk about? Ephesians 5 talks about there are certain things that should not be spoken about. Uh, Ephesians 5, verses 10 through 13. You should not talk about certain things. So in Christian means, you don't talk about the details, the gross details, of someone's failure or of some immorality. You do not do that. It'll defile people. But the last thing is, do you seek to heal people? Do you seek to heal the faults? Now, not all fault lines are dangerous, but the dangerous ones I'm talking about. Now, I just want to ask, what could cause an earthquake in a Christian church? Because you might say, today, there's so many Christian churches it's not bad there's a variety. Variety is not wrong. But division is wrong. Variety is wonderful. Remember, there's one body but many members. There's many members in the body. It's okay to have a variety of the Lord's gatherings in Africa, Asia, the Pacific, uh, Midwest, wherever you are. There could be a variety. But when those gatherings are divided, then you got to say what's wrong for division. So uh, Galatians 3, verse 26. For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free man. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's descendants, heirs according to promise. You see, verse 28. You are all one in Christ Jesus. Will you stay in the truth? That is what that is the unity of the Holy Spirit. You are one in Christ Jesus. Where do Christians divide on? On gender issues, right? A male nor, nor 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 female. They foolishly allow gender issues to split a gathering. And it says uh, neither Jew nor Greek. There are racial issues. How foolish of us to allow racial issues to split us. There's neither slave nor free. There's economic issues, right? The rich and the poor, the middle class, the upper class, the lower class, are the no class people, <laughs> wherever you are, you know? That's not the Christian church. That's the world. For you are all one in Christ. It, it, it doesn't mean that men and women don't have different roles. That's not what this is saying here. But there's no reason for division amongst men and women at all in Christ. So the reason why churches divide is they leave their unity in Christ and they try another unity. And in doing that, they separate into partisan camps or they just separate for life. This is the tension in Acts 6. It's a serious assault. What, what are the issues? Verse 1, that's my first point. Faith, food, finances, and favoritism. That's what's at stake in Acts 6, verse, verse 1. Now, at that time, well, the disciples were increasing in number. So that's the faith, right? There's disciples. There's faith. Ones who want to tr trust the Lord. A complaint arose on the part of the Hellenistic Jews against the native Hebrews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily serving of 
Uh, and it, it says of food in the American Standard, it, 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 it's added. But basically what you had is you had in the church at that time, you had a community opportunity to come to a place and receive food, but also if you had a financial need. There was money available if you had a need. Remember Acts 4 verse 32 says, And the congregation of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and not one of them claimed that anything belonging to them him was his own, but all things were common property to, to them. Verse 34. For there was not a needy person among them, for all who were owners of land or houses would sell them and bring the proceeds of the sales and lay them at the apostles' feet, and they would be distributed to each as any had need. It should be that way today also, brother. That's not pie in the sky past. I don't mean exactly like this, but I mean the idea. But the church was meeting needs, not wants. They weren't needing wants. They were meeting needs. Those are different things, right? So amongst Lord people, don't indulge what they want, but give them what they need. And so need, needs are being met, so there's a common place where they're gathering. So there's food and finances, but there's the accusation of favoritism. Hey, something's not right here. And the Hellenistic Jews, remember, they're all Jewish people, basically. Not ma They're mainly Jewish people who, who have been saved. So you have Jews around the Mediterranean, North Africa, Rome, Asia Minor. They're the Hellenistic Jews. And then the, the native-born in Galilee, Samaria, Judea, the a native-born. There's two different camps there. And the native-born are more than the foreign-born. Okay? And so the foreign-born are kind of at a disadvantage somehow. What's the essential issue? Satan wants to ruin the church. And what Satan wants to do, he wants to put a stake in the heart of agape love. Because agape love is impartial. Agape love has no favoritism. Satan wants there to be a human partiality love working, not impartial, objective agape love. So in the very moment of blessing, this pops up. What's wrong? How'd this happen? When there is great growth in, in Christian numbers, there is also the increase of impurity in the church. Because when you got a whole bunch of people showing up, not everybody has their act together who shows up. Not everybody. Some people are there for the food, not so much for the faith. <laughs> they're not, they want the food. Now, it doesn't mean they're not Christians. It doesn't mean these are unsaved people. Genuine Christians bring their San Andreas fault into the church. Instead of being healed in their heart, the natural man, the carnal man, is alive and well, and he's disguised in religious clothing, he or she. So don't be fooled by appearances. You don't have to be suspicious, but don't be fooled. And so the, the, the favoritism, it doesn't mean that favoritism was actually happening. See, the Holy Spirit does not say it was happening just that there was an accusation. And what Satan wants to do, this is how he kills a Christian fellowship. He uses a poison, ready? The poison is called suspicion. That's the poison in the body of Christ. Because suspicion breeds doubt. And once you have doubt, everything is paralyzed. As far as God's work. As far as God's work. Because God can't work through unbelief. Or bitterness, or you know those types of things. You know, so what's the problem happening here? A complaint arose on the part of the Hellenistic Jews. So, what does this word "complaint" mean? It means to murmur in private, in the sense of secret debate, and in the sense of um, private displeasure. Did you hear that? Yeah. Um, Sarah told me that. Sam told me that. John told him that. <laughs> David told. Yeah. Oh, you heard it? Oh, that's okay. Four people removed. It must be true. <laughs> you know, so it's like, it's all this talking, right? Talk, 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 talk. That's the murmuring. So the fire started. And the firefighters are coming to put it out. Because you cannot let this thing grow. If you have a problem with your gathering or your family or your friend circle, you have to go to leadership and in all humility and say, this is, is this a problem? You've got to ask the question. Is this a problem? It doesn't mean it is a problem, right? 
You have to ask, is this a problem? You cannot secretly gossip and fester. You must put it out in your heart. In your heart, friends, here. you got it in your heart. You have to deal with it. And so let it get dealt with. So these four things are happening. Um, how do we put out the fire of uh, you know, bitterness and anger? Because the, these people are mad. The Hellenistic Jews, they're saying, hey, our widows are just as good as those widows. They didn't get enough of this, and they got more, and they got less. Luke 17, verse 1. He said to his disciples, it is inevitable that stumbling blocks come, but woe to him through whom they come. It would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown to sea than that he would cause one of these little ones to stumble. Be on your guard. If your brother sins, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times a day and returns to you seven times, saying, I repent, forgive him. The apostle said to the Lord, increase our faith. Increase our Lord, it's too much. We don't have enough faith. I can forgive my brother twice. And if he brings me a, uh, like a donut, I'll forgive him. <laughs> but three times that stretching at four? Oh, no, not four times. No, no. Don't we do that in Christian churches? Don't we make our offendedness the most important thing? Have we forgotten the one who hung on the cross, bleeding to death because of you and me? Have we forgotten the one who was tortured for us? Not just the other person, but for, how did we forget that? No, your problem, saints, is not that big a deal compared to uh, what the Lord did at the cross. We are to forgive. And so the fifth F, the cleansing, right? The cleansing thing is forgiveness. Forgiveness is the cleansing mechanism in a church. You confess and you forgive. You confess and you... What if they don't confess? That's right. Some people are so stubborn they're not going to confess. Some believers are. As sad as that is. You still have a forgiving heart anyway. No grudges on your end. Pursue peace with all men and the sanctification without which no man shall see the Lord. So you don't go around in anger. I'll tell you, many marriages collapse because of lack of forgiveness. It's the lack of forgiveness that divides spouses. It's the lack of forgiveness that divides siblings. It's the lack of forgiveness that divides brothers or sisters in a church. Forgive. Ask and give. Ask it and give it. And God will honor you. And the Lord said in uh, Matthew 18, Peter says, how many times should I forgive? Seven times? The Lord said, no, 70 times seven. 70 times seven. Yeah, you know, Christians have problems. I'll tell you, join the club. Don't we all? We're all needy. So let's not pretend we're not. Self-righteousness is the great enemy of Christian reconciliation. It's a great enemy when you're a self-righteous believer. Let's go through the rest. Immediate solution to preserve growth. The apostles have an answer. They have an answer, and it's immediate. Do you have solutions for the trouble? We need solutions. And the next one, quality men for daily needs. Their solution is, is going to be quality people. Quality is a solution. That is a solution quality servant leaders and they're for daily needs whenever the church has something to do can a quality person step up and do it here we have um, the beginning of deacons uh, so we're just going to go over a couple of points with this deaconship so the first thing uh, we see is that they're selected by the congregation and they're not appointed by the disciples so, apostles, uh, apostles. Yeah, sorry about that. so they're not like uh, the people at the top are deciding who's going to be kind of uh, the ones helping and the ones kind of in, you know, in the leadership roles, but they let the congregation decide. Uh, the second one is that there are multiple selected. So there's not just one selected, there's multiple selected. And I think two things are cool about that. One is that it shows that there's opportunity, uh, opportunity for others to rise up and uh, serve and have a place of service within the church. And also just showing that the necessity for community within the church, just in a sense that like, hey, there's not just one pastor leading and deciding everything, but there's actually uh, a whole group of people, in this case deacons, uh, serving others and appointed to serve others. So we look at what they have required out of these to be selected out of these, and the first one is to have a good reputation. So to have a good reputation, 
basically means like you don't have problems with your neighbors, you're not blasting music super loud and getting noise complaints, uh, but you're upstanding in that community. Uh, the next one is going to be that they're full of the spirit and wisdom. We see in verse 3, full of the spirit and wisdom. Galatians 5.22, it says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, uh, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, uh, gentleness, and self-control. So these are the qualities that uh, they want to see out of these men being selected in their daily life. And then uh, one thing it says in 1 Timothy 3.12, it says that they need to be good managers of their homes. The church is... God's home. So as deacons, they must know how to manage God's people uh, the same way that they would a family and just kind of understanding that those dynamics well. Uh, and then 1 Timothy 3.10 says, These men must first be tested. Let them serve as deacons if they're beyond reproach. So to help lead God's flock, God wants tested, tried and true believers who have gone through the fires of the tests and came out still smiling. What God doesn't require, they're not asking for five years of theological degree, they're not asking for ten years of seminary, uh, they're not asking for a huge friend group, and they're not asking for loads of money. So, I want to encourage everyone here to seek to uphold these standards in our daily lives, and even if we're not necessarily appointed uh, as a deacon or have a title in our own church to seek to have a good reputation, seek to be full of the Spirit and have wisdom. Um, and that, in the end, is what God is looking for. It's what God, it's what they're looking for. It's what the apostles are looking for. And the congregation is looking for here um, in Acts to appoint these deacons. And we should all search to uphold those standards and fight to uphold those standards in our own personal lives and our lives with God. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Now, take note. Quality men for daily needs. It's the need that creates the opportunity for service. The need calls for the deacons. It's the need that creates it. What do we do that's upside down? We create a position, and we try and find a need. <laughs> we give people titles. You're the associate this and that. You're this and that and this and that. It's fine to be associate pastor. God bless you. But I mean, you got so many titles. What is the New Testament pattern? <laughs> Elders and deacons. Apostles, too. We're going to talk about that. They're still around. They haven't disappeared. Not the 12 apostles. They're gone. Not those apostles. But what is God's structure? When you stay with God's structure, you're strong. Keep it simple, saints. That's right. Keep it simple, saints. That's right. Sanctify thing for that, you know? Just in simplicity. Don't, don't be someone who wants, a, who wants a position and then they make a need for you to do. What a waste of time. That's what government does. They hire more people and they, oh, got to find a job for you. Okay, we'll create a need somewhere and go do the job. Just do God's job. Don't do the wrong job. Do go Meet the needs. It's the needs that matter. And, and the deacons are handling finances. Now, there's a lot of money floating around that fellowship. A lot, of, a lot of people are selling the land. There, there's some cash, coins and stuff. So they're managing it with the food and other types of things. It's a very responsible thing to do. But you don't have to have 20 sub-levels. Just what does God want you to do? Next section. Um, unstoppable rise of a servant teacher. He is on the rise. He is rising strong. Uh, verse 8, full of grace and power. Why is he full of grace and power? Because he's full of faith. Because he has faith. That's why he has grace. So Stephen is now, he's not just doing the tables anymore. He's upped the game. Because the needs of God's people are more than just food and like pay the bill. That's good. That's not bad. But there's a deeper need to be, be met. There are greater needs. There's suffering people. There's confused people. Why could the servant leader rise? Because the church got its act together. The church repented of division and turned their back on division and kicked it out the door. And they kept the unity of the spirit and the uniting bond of peace. It is a unified church that gives birth to strong servant leaders. There are so few Stevens today because there's so few godly unified churches. They do exist, by the way. There's just less of them. The servant teacher comes out of weight on tables, and he's unstoppable because they uh, argue with them, 9 and 10. You know, they uh, name the um, synagogues. 
There's five synagogues. There's two in Asia Minor and three in North Africa and Rome. It's a coalition. It's a coalition to stop this guy. All the smarty pants in the Western Mediterranean, they're coming after him with their guns blazing because they think they know law of Moses. But they can't stop him. They were unable, verse 10, unable to cope with the wisdom and spirit with which he was speaking. That is, they had no effect. They couldn't answer him. They couldn't stop him. And so you know what happens? Next um, part, dishonest conspiracy to silence Stephen. Because they can't stop him, they got plan B. These are religious people talking to each other. These are not Romans. The Romans do not care about this. But the religious Jews care. Oftentimes amongst Christians, these things happen in their worst. I mean, in the worst way. I'm talking over 20 centuries. These things have happened. You have a dis dishonest conspiracy. They basically lie about him. They draw up charges. If the enemy cannot win in the free marketplace of ideas, then the enemy will go to the uh, secret marketplace. There's the open marketplace of free ideas because everyone's hearing the debates, right? Everyone hears it. It's very public. Like 20 against one. <laughs> He's winning. This guy's winning all the time. 20 against one. And so if you can't win in the free marketplace of open ideas, they're going to go to the secret marketplace of conspiracy, slander, and ultimately murder. They will use the secret marketplace of conspiracy because they cannot answer. See, people are dishonest. They don't care about the truth. They don't care about the right answer. They don't care. You know, wait, maybe the Levitical system did have an expiration date on it. Maybe it did have an expiration date. Because they're saying, verse uh, 14, well, we heard him say that this Nazarene Jesus will destroy this place and alter the customs. So they care about the temple and they care about the practices. The temple was impressive. The practices were impressive. But they were empty and God had left them. God had left that whole scene. He wasn't there anymore. But they wanted to continue the facade. And so they, they were more interested in tradition, reputation, and revenge. That's what they cared about. This is theological disputes amongst Christians today. Some, some, not all. It gets that bad. It does get that bad. revenge. Revenge, why? Because they were they they looked bad. They looked really bad. Also, you know why they care? Verse uh, seven, it says that the uh, great many of the priests were becoming obedient to the faith. You had all these priests, they're leaving team Judaism and they're going to team Jesus. <laughs> they're switching teams. They're, they're throwing in their football uniform for team Judaism. No more. I'm going to turn in my helmet. I'm not on that team anymore. They're going to have a new outfit. Christ alone. <laughs> Christ is their glory. Many priests. Hey, this temple could shut down if these guys keep going. Like, who's going to run it, right? <laughs> All the priests are going. We better stop it. This is a battle to maintain Jewish tradition. And these guys are going for the throat. What's uh, Stephen like? He's a radiant witness on the stand. They drag him away to, to the council. I mean, where's the Romans at? Where's the Romans law? <laughs> What's going on here? It's just, see, they don't play fair. The enemy doesn't play fair when they want to silence you. So don't be surprised if liberties are suspended in this country, or you're told to stay in your house, or you'll be put in prison. Don't be surprised by that, okay? They don't play fair. But what's Stephen doing? He's radiant. The face of an angel. He's on the witness stand. There's hundreds of people in this place. Hundreds and one. What are the odds here, right? He's ready. But he's not going to insult them. He's not going to rail on them. You know how God prepares us to be a radiant witness on the stand? When in your own Christian church, someone offends you and you're forgiving towards them. And you go to them as a radiant Christian. So he's radiant and he's standing and he's ready. What an incredible man that Stephen is. This, is. this should be the Christian church today. A radiant witness in this country. A radiant witness. Because we're going to be put on the witness stand. We're going to be put, put on there. So here's what I wanted to give you for a practical thing. Are we a problem solver or a troublemaker? What are you? If you're a problem solver first, you're going to pay attention to the need. You will investigate. 
what happened not rumors okay you got to go to the source you cannot believe one side third you will take open action it's open right they called everyone together it was open this was a huge meeting there were a lot of believers there but you know what the uh fourth thing take open they're going to explain their reasons they say it's not good for us to abandon the word of god to weigh the tables so they're explaining it because the word of God is going to change a planet, right? It's going to change the whole world. So don't bottle it up doing the dish. <laughs> okay. Uh, but you got to know, um, like, a division of labor in the church, right? There's different things happening. Explain the reasons. But, but you know, yeah, and, and then you get agreement. They say they get agreement of the fellowship. Unanimity should be the rule of all churches. This is not voting. It's not 60%, 40%. It is such a fallacy. It's so wrong. Unanimity of the spirit. It must be unanimous or don't do it. Maybe the church wants to do a pro project and 10% don't want to do it. Then don't do the project. Don't do it if 10%, I mean, real people, I don't mean fake who just kind of hang out in Trump, but real people are in the church, right? You cannot do it. You So you pray for them. You love them. You, you give them time. You don't bully them or pressure them or lobby them. You pray for them. You show them love. And, you know, sometimes, I'll tell you, a lot of times when it comes to groups, there's there's a number of times where the minority is right and the majority is wrong. Because group think is, is a curse in this country. It's a curse in many places. Group think. Sometimes the minority is right. Sometimes. So you get agreement. You must get agreement. By the way, when you, when you get agreement, don't do the open mic and have everyone say anything. <laughs> sometimes it can be kind of a... A drag, but you do get get agreement, okay? There's a different way to it. And then last of all, pray, pray, pray. Everything covered in prayer. To be a problem solver, you must pray. Question one. From verses two through seven, what are the duties of the apostles both then and now? How is this different from but complementary with the responsibilities of deacons? I know this has been a tradition forever, but it really doesn't pin it down what the work of a deacon is. Well, yeah, the, the scripture cannot say every possible thing you could do. That'd be a huge well, book. It, does, okay? it doesn't really say any. It doesn't well, no, say it does. But no, it, it, no it, it, it says some things, but the emphasis in 1 Timothy 3 is the quality, like the right. quality of the man. What they do is an open thing, right. but, 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 they are, but the word is servant. It is a servant. It's not the boss, not the boss. But in the service, it's not just the tables. I don't want to say that like that's the only thing you do. It's a wide variety of things. It's a wide scope of things. And we're not trying right. to pin down the whole list. Yeah, yeah. You don't pin the whole list down. But question one's meant to talk about the complement. See, complementary. That's for so these. They complement El, um, elders. Oh well, I said well, well, the apostles. Well, there's also elders too. But I'm just talking about apostles because there's uh, apostles there. In, a, in this brand of Christianity, it's only pastor. That's the word. And God bless pastors. But you're missing something sometimes in the larger idea of God's work in the church. Um, because you can overemphasize and neglect something. That's what I'm saying. Don't neglect all of God's gifts to the church. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 28. And God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, their teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healings, helps, administrations, various kinds of tongues. Now, the word gifts is an English word. But it has to do with a spiritual influence, a spiritual ability is given. But he says, um, first apostles. Now, if it's first, that's important. He says first. But no one talks, not many people talk about it. Not many talk about it. Where are they? There are apostles today. And, and I'm not so it's, there's not the 12 apostles. God bless them. They founded the church and revelation. Their names are written on the heavenly city. I'm not talking about them. That's a unique group God used in a unique way to found the church. But the, the idea of an apostle is a church builder, someone who's sent out. And the, God, and the Lord uses them to plant and build churches. They're not necessarily there as an elder would be. An elder would be there, watch the church. Remember Acts 14, you read about Paul and um, Barnabas are going around uh, Asia Minor, and there's churches being raised up. And then they go back later and they appoint elders because elders need 
because they didn't have elders when they first started, but they're a church. They are a church. And then elders are raised up. So the elders are stationary, you might say. They're stationary there. The apostles are mobile, moving in between the churches. So you could have talent, gifted men moving amongst different places. Uh, and, and they should be accountable somewhere. I don't want to go into too much, but they should be. And not that they're, don't be the Lone Ranger. Scripture says you need to be accountable place fellowship. But you can go forth from a place and be a blessing to many places. Apostles are being used by, the, we may not recognize them. And you don't need a title, by the way. Don't look for the badge. You don't need the badge. It's it's the person and what they're doing is what matters uh, so much. And then you could figure it out later with what's happening. So they are complementary. You could say the apostles are starting the churches. The deacons are strengthening the churches. They're strengthening the churches. Start and strength, those, those types of things. May every um, saint aspire, though, to have apostolic messages apostolic vision you could have apostolic vision that starts churches sister so-and-so god could use you to start churches in the right place hundred thousand percent yes god could use you i i didn't say run the church i said start the church start it god can use you with apostolic vision and disciple it. absolutely can so there's there's things happening <clears throat> next, next question please thank you from verse three a problem has come up when the first deacons are appointed using certain criteria to meet the need. What character qualities are needed to fill church leadership roles? Does God apply rules such as modern day diversity, equity, inclusion, and or meritocracy when calling a man or a woman to serve? Yes, we're trying to be relevant in the Bible study. We're yeah. trying to be relevant and timely and not talk about the fourth of the century. <laughs> I'm trying to about right now is when we're living. Why is it not that? Quotas that, that you have to fill a certain yeah you know, uh, skin categories, color, whatever, yeah, whoever they are. Groupings. See, we just want people who are filled with the spirit, and yeah. Well, my thought is these are kind of man-made, created divisions and rules government created things so here's what's happening worldly thinking invades a church all the time and so in the worldly thinking people copycat they copycat the world and so this is what the world says well okay uh we have this uh big city we want to uh make sure everybody's treated the same way so the way we do it is going to do it through rules and so and they'll say, well, there, there's been a history of certain people not being treated a certain way. So we have to correct that. Right? I mean, we've got to change everything and change all the rules. So here's the thing in God's mind. And like in, the world does whatever it does. OK, they're going to do whatever they do. But in the church, you do not solve problems through selective partiality. Selective partiality does not heal the San Andreas fault in the church. Selective partiality does not heal the brokenness in God's people. What does heal the brokenness in God's people is impartial love. When you have God's impartiality, because God is no respecter of persons, whether it's the janitor or the head pastor, there's no respecter of persons. God doesn't care about your position, so to speak. I mean, so to speak. He cares about your character. He cares about your character, not your title. So, you know, there, there was favoritism in the church. Read about in James chapter 2 and 3. The favoritism did outbreak later in the growth of the church. Favoritism has strongholds in different places. So favoritism does show up. But how do you how do you deal with it? Is it by quotas? Is it by rules? Or do you just make it twice as worse? You cannot use a worldly solution to get a spiritual end. Spiritual means are needed for spiritual ends. So when you have difficult questions like um, they get more, they get you know, who who gets what, just know that in God's house, all of the needs can be met amongst Lord's people. They can all be met somehow, some way. But needs aren't the same as wants. But you don't come into the church and say, can all of you 
pay me back for 20 years when I was mistreated. Like, no, we can't go back and that we can't go back and relive your history and pay you checks because the hit passed. But you, because right now, um, you are a new creation in Christ. Old things are passed away. New things have come. So you're a new creation. New birth is day one. Day one's a new game. Do get rid of the rules. Just, just dump them out because you're a new creation in Christ. It's a brand new ball game now. God does deal with everyone impartially. Some of the Lord's people need to learn that. Well, they need to learn impartiality, but the Holy Spirit can teach it if you're willing to learn it impartiality so i think when you talk about diversity equity and inclusion the standard of judging is the natural it's like external outward appearances your abilities your talents things like that that people judge you on and uh are more accepting of you and filling a position or whatever but to god it's a spiritual quality that god's looking for because God has chosen the foolish things of the world, the weak things of the world. And so are you spiritual? Do you believe? Do you trust? Are you going, going to obey? That's what matters to God. Amen. Not the external. It'd be so shallow to look at natural things. That's not how God chooses. Remember, David, seven sons. And Samuel says, we have any more? He's in the field. Go get him. <laughs> Go get that guy. He's in the field. We're not doing anything until I see that last one. Like the despised one, right? He's the king. He is the king, not the talented firstborn. It's, and not, not because there's anything wrong with being the firstborn. Nothing wrong with being the firstborn. It's humility. So don't get out of your firstborn. It's humility that matters and a heart for God. I just want to add having the right motives, uh, especially for filling these leadership roles in churches. Because Paul talks about that false zeal that some people have. That false zeal for, you know, even wanting to go burn at the stake, even wanting to suffer, you know, quote unquote for Christ, but it's for the wrong reasons. Um, mm -hmm. So with that mm -hmm. true leadership roles, we also need the correct motives. And what brings the correct motives is that true death to self and completely dying to yourself and letting that love fill you. That's a deeper thing. That's harder. Some people choose some young guy right away. Some churches, because he's a year or so he's around. We'll put him in leadership. Why are you doing that? He's just he's a young believer, right? Newly saved. Why are you doing that? Well, he's impressive. He's talkative. No, no, no. First Timothy three says, says of elders, not a novice, lest he be lifted up mm -hmm. and fall into the condemnation of the devil. One last thing, dear sisters, you got to ask this question: What character qualities are needed to, for my husband? That's what you should pray about. Study. Uh, single sisters, you know, looking for a husband. Men will come your way. That's not the guy. Don't let the roses, uh, 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 the chocolates fool you. <laughs> don't let that be fooled, okay? It's not the guy. It's character. It's character. It's not the surface stuff. That, that, that's what matters. Okay, third, third question. Uh, from verses 8 to 11, Stephen is falsely accused by his enemies simply to set him up for punishment. How should we react when people dishonestly misrepresent the gospel message we share simply to stop it from being spread? What factors can make our witnessing more like that of Stevens that is more life-changing and effective? Revelation 2 says, let no man take your crown. The devil wants to get you to sin in persecution. He wants you to yell and get upset and stomp your feet and run away and whatever you do. That's what you shouldn't do. He wants to provoke you to sin, dear believer. Humble yourself with the mighty hand of God. So you get ready for persecution from the world by misunderstandings in the church. Or maybe even someone wrong in the church wrongly treats you. You get ready by your love and patience and care. You know? I love um, Luke 35. It says, love your enemies, do good to them. So it, it, it's mm. so countercultural, right? Here they are, they're betraying you, they're backstabbing, they're slandering, they're ostracizing. And what are we called to do? We're called to do good to them. But I love that this has a promise. It says, and to lend to them without expecting anything back, then your reward will be great. And you will be children of the most high, 
because he is kind to the ungrateful and wicked. You just stay the course and you continue to be filled with the spirit and wisdom and truth so that he can empower us. Amen. Yeah. Can you read number four? Verses 12 to 15, House of Hospital for Indigenous Authorities, and it's so comfortable this morning, and all that can do is go to put an innocent man like Stephen to death, just like what happened to the Lord Jesus. Uh, how can we avoid competing or complaining against those servants of the Lord who simply desire to challenge us to go and call us to The self idolatry, that's the hidden thing in our human soul. They feel like they're defending God. Like John 16, 1, they think they're doing God a service. Right. They think they are. Stephen was showing them the truth, and they felt, like, uncomfortable. They didn't want to face the truth about who and what they really were. They didn't want to be pushed. And then for the second question, if our hearts aren't close to the Lord, we're going to be wanting to lash out and complain against mm -hmm. those who want to challenge us. Um, so I think one way is to be daily asking the Lord to show us where our hearts really are in our relationship. Amen. Amen. Where are our hearts really at? Do you want to know? Do you want to know the answer? God will tell you if you read his word. They've been misled by the devil and they're believing his lies. And they're not listening to their conscience and God through the word. So they're just going down their own paths. And that for how we can avoid persecuting or complaining against our servants of the Lord, we need to listen to them and examine ourselves instead of judging or getting angry. I think that we should judge the message, not the man. Because sometimes we look at the messenger and we look at how they're saying it to us and we shut down because they're saying it in a way that we don't like but we're not listening to the message that mm -hmm. they're bringing. And then the other thing is to mm -hmm. not live by that idea that the ends justify the means. So if we're so self-righteous, we can tend to, you know, allow for things like even murder because we think that the ends justify the means. Yeah. The ends uh, never justify the means. God wants good means and good ends all the time. Both are to be in the perfect will of God, not one or the other. And when it comes to knowing other believers in the church, don't look at them and despise them by their appearance or by a handicap or by a weakness. Listen to the message coming out of them. It's the character that counts. It's what they're bringing forth. Now, don't exalt them either. Don't make them a favorite class. Or don't put them down. Just be impartial. Love the saints. Love all of God's people impartially. And God will honor that church, and that church will be indestructible in uh, these end times that we're coming into, that, that impartial love. Did anybody else have a quick thought that hasn't been, that may have been shared tonight? It seems like we're at a time with many churches now that you either have one dominant leader or you've got a total democracy and everything is put up to vote and majority rules. There isn't really as much of a spiritual development in decision-making as there is just natural sway who can influence a group or what makes sense to just the numbers. Thank you. It's so true of Christianity today. There are such imbalances, but the scripture brings us into the unity of the spirit and the uniting bond of peace. We don't need fault lines all over the churches where things that have fallen apart. We need things healed and a godly balance that's biblical. The biblical model for the church is the best. Don't do something else to attach to it. What is God's mind for that? And as we close, just to say, uh, Stephen's going to be on the stand next chapter, and he's going to be probably the best speech that a martyr is about to give, and the storm clouds are about to burst on the church at Jerusalem. Because Acts 8 says the persecution arises, and they all got to go that day. It's just about over at Jerusalem. It's going to be hit hard now with the storm, but at least they got it in shape. So Lord bless you.